Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. In this video, I wanted to take you through an argument that has been raging in economics discourse for a long time, but especially since 1975, uh, when the book Equality and Efficiency, The Big Trade-Off was published. Uh, the writer of the book is Arthur Okun, um, and the book, as the title suggests, basically makes an argument that uh, society faces trade-offs between creating an equal society where incomes are very similar, wealth is very similar, things like that, um, and, and maintaining the kinds of incentives that are necessary to get people to be productive, to get people to be innovative, and that sort of thing. Um, and conservatives have really kind of seized upon this argument uh, ever since 1975, and perhaps before then, um, in order to make the argument that hey, uh, people who really want an equal society, yeah, it seems very, uh, you know, it seems very kind and whatever. But in the long run, when you try to create equality, it so destroys economic growth and innovation that actually the poor are even worse off. So while it might seem like we are really cruel and advocating for high levels of poverty and high levels of inequality, actually in the long run, we're being the people that are most you know, beneficial to everyone, including the poor who seem to be you know, losing out so much by uh, having a very highly unequal system. Um, and an example of someone who seized upon this argument, I would say most famously, was uh, Miss Margaret Thatcher. Uh, may she uh, rest not in peace. Um, here's a video from her, a very famous video from her from 1990. She's uh, uh, talking to the British Parliament, and you can see, see how she picks upon this argument. But what the Honorable Member is saying is that he were rather the poor were poorer, yeah, yeah. provided the rich were less rich. That way you will never create the wealth for better social services yeah. as we have. And what a policy. Yes, he would rather have the poor poorer, provided the rich were less rich. That is a liberal policy. So, you know, I mean, and it's not just that example. I mean, really, a lot of the neoliberal turn, such as it is uh, in the 1980s, in, in rhetoric, whether you're talking about Reagan in the United States, whether you're talking about Thatcher in the United Kingdom, whether you're talking about conservative parties winning across Europe, in, including in Northern Europe, they all were kind of enraptured in part by this argument that says that actually these egalitarian policies that we've pursued since the early part of the 20th century, which have helped reduce inequality, increase public ownership, these kinds of things, these, these social democratic measures, they're actually sapping. They're actually sapping the dynamism and innovation of our economy. And if we would just stop focusing so much on inequality and, and, and fairness and that sort of thing, we would unleash the job creators, unleash investment, unleash entrepreneurialism, unleash innovation, and the growth would be so great that even the people who you're taking all this money from, even the people who you're kind of crushing or appear to be crushing in the process of this, they're actually going to be better off because the economy is just going to be that much more productive. Now, the problem with this argument is, you know, this book came out in 1975. Around 1970, the OECD started collecting, you know, pretty solid cross-country statistics. And so we've had kind of a 50-year experiment that we can look at in which we say, okay, well, so some economies are way more equal than others, and they have these social democratic states where wages are very compressed, right? The lowest paid worker and the highest paid worker, the difference between them is very small, um, relatively speaking. Uh, they have high taxes, high welfare, high public ownership, they have unions, they've got all these kind of egalitarian institutions. And the, and, and the most typical countries people will point to that have taken that the furthest are the Nordic countries, which we see in this graph here of Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you have a country like the United States, very little unionization, low tax level, extreme diversion of wages, extreme diversion of disposable income. Okay, great. So let's see how that played out. As we see in this graph here, uh, starting in 1970, 
between uh, 1970 and 2020, you can see GDP per hour work. So that's how productive workers are on an hourly basis between these economies. If you look at it at a glance, there's really no difference, right? I mean, uh, the United States is in the lead in 1970. By 2021, Norway is caught up. Now, Norway, of course, has oil and gas, so that's a little bit unfair. Uh, but Denmark has caught up as well um, and has fully surpassed the United States. It doesn't really have oil and gas. Sweden is right there. Finland is lagging, but Finland started out uh, at the lowest level. Um, but if you look at growth rates, which was the second graph here, uh, Finland has gone up uh, more than anyone else. Between 1970 and 2021, Finland has the Finland's GDP per hour work has grown by nearly 250%. In the United States, it's only about 125%. And you can see all four Nordic countries grew more since 1970 than the United States uh, grew since 1970. So we don't really actually seem, when you, on its face, it doesn't look like there's any trade-off here. They're way more equal, and yet their productivity is marching up right in line with the United States, and if anything, uh, is exceeding the United States. This leads us to the counter. So I guess I should refresh. You have this initial move that says there's this trade-off. Then you've got 50 years of data that says doesn't look like it. So there's got to be a third move, a counter-counter move that explains away this data, that tries to, to salvage the initial argument, saying, oh, no, the initial argument really was correct. Yeah, the data doesn't look good for that argument, but it is still initially correct. And we got the best stab at that in 2012. And this paper, even though it's just a working paper, I don't think they actually ever published it in, in, in a full-blown journal. Um, but they published this working paper in 2012. It's Darren Asimoglu and, uh, you know, his friends here, James Robinson, uh, Verdier. They published this paper, and this paper continues, continues to be a big part of conservative politics. You see it mentioned here and there. I saw it the other day in The Economist. People love this paper because it seems, like I said, to salvage the argument from all this countervailing data that suggests that actually the equality efficiency trade-off stuff is just bullshit. So what is this paper? The paper is titled, Can't We All Be More Like Scandinavians? Asymmetric Growth and Institutions in an Interdependent World. In the abstract, it starts out this way. Because of their more limited inequality and more comprehensive social welfare systems, many perceive average welfare to be higher in the Scandinavian societies than in the United States. Why then does the United States not adopt Scandinavian-style institutions? You know, so they're they're acknowledging ah, they seem to grow pretty well. Their welfare and 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 if you have the same amount of growth and you're distributing that growth much more evenly than for the average person, especially the bottom twenty percent, bottom thirty percent, way better off in that kind of society. So what gives? And the answer they eventually come up here with here is this one. Um, and they're using a kind of toy little model here. I mean, this is not actually an effort to answer the question, why has the United States not adopted Scandinavian-style institutions? Because that's a political question. But they're trying to come up with, so with some kind of other model that might explain why it would make sense for the U.S. not to do it, even though other countries do it and whatever, right? And here we got it. Some countries will opt for a type of cutthroat capitalism that generates greater inequality and more innovation and will become the technology leaders, while others will free ride on the cutthroat incentives of the leaders and choose a more cuddly form of capitalism. Now let's put aside whether you want to you call you know, the Nordic societies uh, cuddly capitalism when they have the level of, of public ownership and whatever they have. Put that aside. The way that this works here is they go, oh, yeah, I know Okun said in 1975 that there was a trade-off between essentially economic growth and equality. And yeah, I, I can see that that does not appear to be the case, that yes, these countries are growing just as much as the U.S. does. But what if that's not because they're just as innovative as the U.S.? What if that's not because people still go out and start new businesses, people implement uh, you know, labor-saving strategies, they increase productivity. What if, it's, what if that's not it? What if instead, 
all the Nordic nations, they're just kind of peeking over the Atlantic and looking at us. And every time we come up with a new thing, you know, which only we can come up with because we're super unequal and, and inequality is what allows you to come up with new shit, right? Well, every time our inequality generates great innovation, they just copy it. So they don't really, so, so Okun was right, but what he missed was this international component where uh, you can have a very equal society and they can still grow as fast as unequal societies so long as they just copy from them, right? So long as they just copy so they could still do it. You know, and that, that, that's what this is meant to, you know, eventually get across. Ah, we we found a way to square the circle. Okay, on its face, kind of silly, but let's see how they try to prove this. Okay. <laughs> so what they're trying to do is come up with a, me a, a measure of innovativeness, right? If you're trying to prove one country is more innovative than another, how do you, how do, you do that? Innovation is a very nebulous concept. Uh, GDP would be one thing you might look at because, you know, in order for GDP to grow, especially GDP per hour, you got to come up with new innovations to make labor more productive on an hourly basis. Uh, but they don't want that, right? Because we just saw GDP per hour and that doesn't support their conclusion. So we have to come up with another way to measure innovativeness that you know allows us to kind of cancel out all the copycat shit that people might do from one country to another. So what they do is they say these differences in innovation may partly reflect... Wait, no. Let's see. Um, duh, duh, duh. So what they want to do to illustrate differences in innovation behavior, they want to look at p patenting behavior, right? Because they matter. Well, if you have an innovation, you patent it, right? So we'll just see who has more patents. That seems that seems reasonable, I guess. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So let's look at that. So they say, oh, let's let's start with figure two. Ah, oh, look, patents filed per million residents. Look, the United States is this bar, and look, they patent way more than. Yeah, not in 1995 they didn't patent more, but really l lately they've been, the United States has been patenting like crazy. My God, almost doubling our patents per million residents. That's, that's pretty extreme. Um, now they realize that, well, just counting the number of patents that Norwegians file with the Norwegian office and Americans file with the American office, that just, that, that might, as they say, reflect differential patenting propensities. Maybe in the United States, people just love to patent shit. Whereas in Norway, if you come up with a new way to do something, maybe you just do it and you don't patent it. You just, you know, implement it in your business and move along. If other people copy it, they copy it, right? That could be a problem. So <laughs> here's, here's what they say. To control for this difference, we adopt another strategy. We presume that important, highly cited innovations are more likely to be targeted to the world market and thus patented in the U.S. Patent Office, right? So what they decide to do is they want to count up how many patents per million residents are filed with, and this is between 1980 and 1999, with the U.S. Patent Office. So it's how many Americans have filed patents, with the U.S. Patent Office, how many Norwegians have filed patents with the Patent Office, or I should say how many patents per million residents, right? So it's how many patents are coming from these countries into the U.S. Patent Office. Now, already you should be like, mm, that seems a little unfair. Americans might put more patents in the U.S. Patent Office than Norwegians, you know, since it is the Americans' Patent Office. Already that should bother you. Um, on the horizontal axis here, they do the number of sites, so if you have like more than 30 citations, you would show up here. And they're trying to say, look, if it has 30 citations, then that must mean it's a really damn important innovation. And look, America's got, you know, like here, they only have like 30 citations. They only have 30 patents for every 100 we have at, at 30 sites. So there you go. That's the argument they make. Let's look at patenting behavior. That's, that's going to be a great proxy for innovation. Here's the problem with this approach, okay? And this is a 2014 CBO report from the Congressional Budget Office um, titled Federal Policies and Innovation. An exciting, what an exciting report. 46 pages, I hope you all click through and read it. Um, but they go through a lot of shit in here, but the part that's interesting to me and that directly uh, reflects on the validity of this paper is this graph on page 34, figure 3, 1. And what they show here 
is the annualized growth in patenting activity, and they compare it to total factor productivity. Total factor productivity here is like a rough approximation of innovation. Um, it's, it's the amount of growth that is not attributed to an increase in labor and an increase in capital, and therefore we kind of sometimes roughly say that that's sort of innovation, okay? So in 1963 and 1983, Right, each year between those twenty years, the number of patent applications going up by a by less than one percent, right at one percent. Patent grants the same amount. Total factor productivity again, right around one percent. Then, in 1983 and 2013, patenting activity explodes. It explodes to damn near six percent. So we get a six-fold increase in patenting activity. This is inside the United States. Okay, six-fold increase in patenting activity. Patent grants also go up by five and a half fold. So with just way more patenting is going on. But then total factor productivity, which like I said, is a kind of rough proxy for how much innovation is driving growth, unchanged. I mean, maybe up a little bit, unchanged, but for the most part. <laughs> so right off the bat, like internal to the US, we don't see patenting activity as actually reflecting innovation, reflecting innovation driven growth. And the reason we probably don't see this is because people patent for all sorts of bullshit reasons and patent trolling in particular has become a huge problem. And they, they go into this in this paper here, right? So many critics of the patent system argue that the patent office has made it too easy to obtain a patent. As a result, patents are often of low quality, meeting only the lowest standards of usefulness, uh, novelty, and non-obviousness, yet allow an inventor to exclude others from using the patented technology. And they actually go on to say, look, like, uh, what's going on with all these patent trolls? They're patenting, like, uh, groups of patents that are relevant to a particular technology, uh, and then suing people who try to use that technology. And this actually makes innovation harder because it slows the introduction of new products because if some other firm wants to use the innovation, now they got to deal with all the patent trolling. Small companies especially are going to have a hard time dealing with the patent trolling. And so in a perverse way, patents are not indicating innovation. They have become a tool to limit innovation. The more patenting activity you have, probably the harder it is for people to get shit going. But if you don't believe that, as a just kind of like, hey, your instrument sucks, we have this uh, direct refutation coming from three Nordic economists. Um, this was in Vox EU, published in 2012. Again, this seems like old hat, but like I said, I just saw this the other day. I see it in conservative columns all the time. In conservative videos, we'll bring it up. I'm sure there's some PragerU videos. It, this, this is the thing that's like supposed to be the smart argument against you know, creating an equal society, okay? So in this refutation, they just title it, Are the Nordic countries really less innovative than the United States? Do the cuddly Nordic countries free ride on the cutthroat incentives for innovation in the U.S. system? Uh, and they say no, actually, that doesn't happen. And, and they use the, this is probably the key table of this uh, little piece here. They say, hey, if you want to use indicators of innovation activity, how about instead of how many patents were filed in the U.S. patent office, which is fucking stupid, right? Like here they say, it's quite understandable that U.S. companies dominate patent filings in the U.S. Like, of course, instead of using that, how about some other things? The first thing they do is a direct attack on the idea of, uh, of using U.S. patents. So they say, hey, if you want to try to come up with a way to measure like globally significant patents, instead of using patents that are just in the U.S. patent office, why not use triadic patents? Now, triadic patents are patents that are filed in the U.S., the EU, and Japan, right? So three, three triadic, right? So if they're filed in all three, that's probably a decent indicator of like globally significant technology, right? I mean, it's filed in the three big ones. Um, and if you look at triadic patents, right, which, and also the other thing is that this is less prone to patent trolling because the U.S. Patent Office has just opened the doors to patent trolling, less so in the EU and less so in Japan. It's harder to get patents there, right? So if you've got patents in all three, then maybe you're doing something pretty significant. Who knows? Anyways, triadic patents per million of the population. U.S. has 48.7. 
Sweden, 88. Denmark, 60.5. Finland, 63.9, right? So the U.S. is actually the worst at uh, triadic patenting, which is globally significant. <clears throat> if you want to use another input, instead of patents, which is kind of the output of innovation, or at least the output of patent trolling, <laughs> What about inputs? Let's look at business expenditure on research and development. That's where innovation comes from to a significant extent, right? People do research and development. They come up with new ideas. Every country, Sweden beats the U.S., Finland beats the U.S., Denmark, right there, is right there. How about researchers per 1,000 employed? What percent of your workforce are researchers? Again, that's a good input to innovation. All three countries beat the U.S., how about venture capital as a percent of GDP? That's kind of an input, right? It's not just, you know, because venture capital is a new businesses. How about that? All three beat the United States. And then they use worker reallocation. The, the uh, intuition here is supposed to be that if you have a really innovative, dynamic economy, then workers are going to be moving jobs frequently, right? Because there's new stuff people are doing, and so they have to move into new firms. I actually think that this is not a good indicator it's not a good argument on their end because you would also reallocate a lot of workers if you were copying the innovation of another country right like if you were copying all the innovations the u.s came up with you would also reallocate a lot of your workers and we're trying to argue about what not do you, are you good at copying innovation but are you good at coming up with innovation so the first four i think are do reflect that worker reallocation i think i think that's a mistake on their end but either way, you know, Denmark beats the U.S., Finland's right there, Sweden is quite a bit below, but, you know, it's in the ballpark. So there you go. Even if you like patents, they're beating us on patents. But if you like these other more plausible sort of inputs to innovation, they're beating us on all that, you know? Patent trolling is not innovation. It's not. What do we got next? Okay, this one. This is just an example. Okay, so great. We can use these statistics. We can use, you know, numbers and tables to try to prove things, but maybe we'll take a more qualitative approach. Let's look at, uh, are there any businesses coming out of these areas, right? And I remember this piece from 2015 as in the Financial Times titled Stockholm, the Unicorn Factory. This The Swedish capital produces a disproportionate number of high-value companies. Can it be copied? And they go on and on. Here's the sweet spot here. For Stockholm, the focus of Sweden's industry, True Collar, which is the company they were profiling above, is not an outlier. In the past decade, this city of 800,000 inhabitants has turned out more billion-dollar tech companies than any in Europe, beating metropolis metropolises such as London and Berlin. According to a study by Atomico, on a per capita basis, Stockholm is the second most prolific tech hub globally, with $6.3 billion dollar companies per million people compared to Silicon Valley Valley's 6.9. So we're right there with Silicon Valley, right, coming out of Stockholm. Um, here are some examples. We got Skype. We got Spotify. Who uses Spotify? We got King Digital, which is a company behind Candy Crush and all sorts of mobile games. Minecraft, I think the most successful video game ever coming from uh, Mo Mojang, Mojang. And web payment service, Klarna. I'm always being asked to pay for shit with Klarna these days. Um, and this is just in Sweden. Of course, uh, you've got other companies in the other countries. In Finland, uh, you've got uh, Rovio and Supercell. Rovio makes uh, Angry Birds. Supercell makes uh, Clash of Clans. And, you know, in the tech world, which is supposed to be kind of the cutting edge, they're right there. They're right there. What else? Oh, that brings us to the end. <laughs> uh, I wrote a pay. I didn't write the paper. Excuse me. I published a paper at People's Policy Project. It was written by Nick Warino, edited by Laura Brom, and uh, designed, of course, by the one and only John White. And uh, there's more examples in this paper. I'll put it in the description. In this paper, we constrained ourselves actually to a very narrow type of innovation. We want climate-relevant innovation that's being led by Nordic state-owned enterprises. So not just any company, not like a private company like Spotify, but only Nordic state-owned enterprises. And we came up with one for each country and did like a little case study, which was really fun. So in Norway, they have state-owned electric robo-ships. Basically, you know, 
they have these fully autonomous, 100% battery-powered cargo ships um, that are actually in use, um, but uh, are more than that uh, being developed and, and innovated um, at the moment. They're very good uh, with maritime stuff in these countries. Uh, they, they also like <laughs> do all the like ice-breaking innovation for ships and shit like that um, because, you know, that's where they're located. It's important to them. In Sweden, we have green steel and hydrogen. So there's this product in Sweden called Hybrid, which you can see on this building here. They're creating the first um, steel that uses no carbon, uh, no carbon energy at any point. Steel is usually very, very carbon intention intensive. So instead, they're using non-carbon energy sources to create uh, hydrogen, which they can then set on fire in order to get the heat they need in order to make the steel. They have made some of this already just a year or two ago. They made their first batch and even sold some of it to Volvo. Um, it's still like in process to become fully, fully bone and fully baked. But once they've, they've already figured out all the technology, now it's just building it out. Um, and once they get there, I think they said that uh, that will reduce global emissions once you get it fully done by like 7% or 8% and will completely offset by many fold all the emissions that Sweden as a country emits once they just get that technology online and spread throughout the globe. In uh, Denmark, we have these energy islands that they're building. Uh, this is going to be like the largest, oh, I think it, like the largest energy product in his, energy project in history or something. But basically, they're going to build these artificial islands way offshore, and that's going to allow them to collect wind energy from the ocean in a way that you can't right now. We have offshore wind energy, but you still have to be like pretty close to the mainland. But if apparently if you build an island like this, you can, uh, you know, spread out much further and a kind of like a uh, uh, spoken wheel or hub and spoke uh, type system. Um, and they're doing that. That's pretty wild, very kind of futuristic. Um, State-owned enterprises at the head of that. And then in Finland, we got mines to battery technology. They uh, have state-owned mines, state-owned mine, uh, uh, like lithium companies, battery companies. They're building a whole value chain that goes from ore all the way to battery in uh, Finland that's going to be clean and all this and it's all being done through state-owned enterprises so these are very innovative countries you know, however you want to cut it um, the cuddly capitalism the idea that they're just stealing all the innovations from the US and they can't possibly be innovative because there's no incentive to, to be innovative is is just bunk there's absolutely no evidence for it and plenty of evidence to the contrary now in saying this, maybe it's useful kind of in close to take a step back and ask, why might this be, right? Because, you know, Okun's equality efficiency stuff is really kind of like, it's meant to be an intuitive theory, right? What's, what's the incentive to go out and innovate if you can't, like, you know, make a bunch of money doing it? Why would an entrepreneur want to go out and, and do all this good stuff if they can't, you know, become a billionaire? <laughs> you know, I mean, you get the idea, right? If you reduce the payoff to innovative behavior by creating a very egalitarian society, then it seems like you're going to not get so much innovation, right? That's like the abstract theory. You can see why people might kind of believe it's plausible. Um, I, and you can also see why people might want to seize on it, even if they don't think it's plausible because they want, because they favor highly unequal societies and they don't want to create, you know, tax and welfare systems and all that, right? But, you know, that's, a, that's one theory that you could come up with, but there are plenty of other intuitive theories that would cut in the other direction that, in which you could say, actually, I think a more equal society would be more innovative. So on the bottom end, what a more equal society does is it makes it so that if you fail, you know, if you, if you lose, if you fall to the bottom of society, maybe you tried to start a new business and it collapsed or whatever, on the bottom end, you have a much better cushion right? The risk of failure, the pain of failure, the destitution of failure is eliminated or at least greatly mitigated, right? And so that is very easy to see from there how if the downside of failure is cut off and you don't have to deal with it, then people are going to try more, right? That's going to help innovation, in fact, there's this phrase, I'm not sure where it comes from, but you see it a lot in these discussions that's, that, that goes like this, secure people dare. And that's fun, you know, it's three words, it sounds real epic and profound, but like the basic idea is, is, is 
reasonably sound, right? If you have security, economic security, you feel comfortable, you know that, hey, if I go and try this project and it doesn't work, I'm still going to be okay, then you're more likely to try it. Whereas if you say, hey, if I try this project and it doesn't work, I'm going to be homeless, then you might say, eh, maybe I'll just go get a normal job, <laughs> right? So cutting off the downside of failure seems like, theoretically, it could promote innovation. Now, on the top side, you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the bottom side, I see that. But on the top side, surely reducing the reward to innovation, right, by making society very equal, surely that's going to make it so that people just, they don't want to do it. Who cares? What does it matter if I can't make a ton of money? Now, I'd say there's a couple of things that are wrong with that intuition. The first thing that's wrong with it is that is there really a difference between, for instance, being able to become like, a, uh, being able to get like five million dollars from like succeeding at innovation, and being able to get a hundred billion dollars? Like there is obviously that's a big difference in money wise, and it makes a big impact on inequality. But if you're on the fence about whether to try to be innovative, and someone's like, "Are you really going to sit there and say, eh, if I if I succeed in this, I'm only going to get five million? You know, that's not enough for me. I need at least a bill. I need at least a billion. Like the differences between those two uh, for an individual person, for their actual life, for what they can actually consume and like live is basically zero, right? So that the high inequality at the tippy, tippy top, it's hard to imagine that that difference is enough because of how minimal a difference it would actually make in someone's life, the difference between 10 million and 100 million, for example, because of how small that difference really is to how enjoyable your life can be and how much you can realistically consume. It's hard to imagine that that's actually going to incentivize and motivate more people to be innovators. You know what I mean? Like you can still give them quite a bit of money without giving them giant amounts of money and seems like still get the same level of incentive. The second reason uh, to think that that's not quite right, is you have to ask yourself, how much do these high dollar rewards at, at the various you know esh top echelons of our economy, how much do they really map on to innovative behavior? And how much do they instead map on to extractive behavior? Essentially little glitches in the economic system where people can kind of sit in these niches and just grind money for themselves without actually innovating or doing anything that's like beneficial for society as a whole. So I'll give you a good example of this that I know uh, from my personal life. When I was growing up in high school, there was a guy who was a STEM savant. He was like the just hands down, you know, I'm good at STEM, theoretically. This guy was on a completely other level than I was. He was like a physics guy, a math guy, a computer coding guy. Um, unbelievable, his talents. He would do these like competitions with other schools and just dominate. Uh, he ended up going to an Ivy League school in New England, no surprise. Studied math and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, when he graduated, uh, about five years after he's graduated, after I, I met up with him again and uh, we started talking and he told me that um, he had a job at a hedge fund. And what he did every day is he collected information about Monster Energy Drink. And the reason he did that is because he would make money uh, in this fund. They would make money essentially by buying and selling and doing various things with the stock of the company that uh, their main product is Monster Energy. So he like he like is the top expert in the in the world arguably on on the stock movements and and financials of of Monster Energy. And it's not like he was investing in Monster Energy in the sense that like giving money to Monster Energy, it's just buying and like taking advantage of price movements in the Monster Energy stock. And he made a shitload of money doing it. But is that innovation? Like, uh, is that really how you would want to allocate that kind of talent? Like coming out of high school, if you were like, how would I want to maximize innovation and growth in the society? Um, would I like to put this guy in a lab doing uh, basic research on materials or whatever? Or do I want him uh, learning how to speculate on monster energy drink? Because in our economy, the financial incentives are to do the latter. It's to become a monster energy drink speculator. You make way more money doing that than going doing basic scientific research, even though the basic scientific research is going to be more important for innovation. So 
that's just an example. But other things in tech, I remember there was this line not too long ago that was like, the brightest people of our generation are trying to figure out how to get people to spend more money, to spend more of their time uh, like gardening and artificial gardens in a, in a Zynga Facebook app or whatever, right? <laughs> like how many super intelligent people, their job is to try to just keep people's eyes glued to various forms of entertainment so that they can deliver them ads and then make hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars doing it. Lots, a lot of talent flowing into that sector. Innovation? Not really. I wouldn't say so. And I could go on and on. But the point here is that at the top of the economy, a lot of these jobs that are being incentivized by having high levels of inequality, I say lead to a misallocation of talent. The kinds of people that you would want to be doing the innovation are being misallocated into jobs that aren't important for innovation, but pay a lot of money. And if you have an egalitarian society, what will happen is you'll shrink the income differences between those bullshit jobs that pay a lot and actual decent jobs that they don't pay that much right now, but that are really important for innovation. And if you shrink the differences between those two kinds of jobs, I would imagine someone like my friend would have more fun you know, researching cutting-edge technology. And if there's not a huge income difference between researching cutting-edge technology and speculating on Monster Energy Drink, he probably would have gone into that. And society as a whole would have been a lot better off if that had been the way he was allocated and, and how we had a- allocated tens of thousands of other people who, who are just like him. Um, so point there, I'm not trying to argue like I have definitive proof of all of that. I'm just saying that on a theoretical level, on a theoretical level, you can very easily tell a story that says squishing income differences promotes innovation, does not negate from innovation. And whatever you think of that theory is just as good as the Okun theory, and it has the added benefit of being consistent with the empirical data. <laughs> the, equal, the, the egalitarian Nordic society is just as innovative, if not more so, than the United States. So don't let anyone push that shit on you. Equality, efficiency, trade-off is bullshit. And this effort to revive it by talking about stealing innovation from cutthroat capitalist countries, also bullshit. These countries really do innovate on par with the United States, despite the fact that they have radically less inequality. And there's no reason why we couldn't do it too.